All right, so we're going to go ahead. Our, our topic is scleral lens fitting and troubleshooting. And we're lucky to have with us uh, Dr. Michael Lipson and Dr. Langis Michaud. Slide. Dr. Michael Lipson is an optometrist and assistant professor at the University of Michigan's Kellogg's Eye Center. His clinical practices emphasizes specialty contact lenses, including overnight corneal reshaping, keratoconus, post-corneal transplant, post-refractive surgery, and severe dry eye patients. He conducts clinical research studies on corneal reshaping, vision-related quality of life, myopia control, and new lens designs. He lectures nationally and internationally on specialty lens products and research topics. He is a consultant to Bosch & Lomb's specialty vision products relative to Ortho-K education and other specialty vision products. He is on the GPLI advisory board and last year served as the vice president of the Scleral Lens Education Society. He attended Michigan State University and received his OD degree from the Illinois College of Optometry. Dr. Langis Michaud graduated from the University of Montreal School of Optometry in 1986, where he also obtained his master's degree in physiologic optics in 1998. He is a full professor and the chief of the contact lens department at the University of Montreal since 2001. He is a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry, British Contact Lens Association, Scleral Lens Education Society, and European Academy of Optics, uh, Optometry and Optics. He has published numerous articles in peer-reviewed journals and has been invited to speak in Europe, Asia, and the United States. Finally, Dr. Michaud is the current president of the College of Optometrists of Quebec. So we're very lucky to have both Langis um, and Michael speaking for us tonight. They have a wealth of knowledge. We also wanted to thank our sponsors, which made this event um, possible. We have our diamond sponsors, Art Optical, AVT, Bosch & Lom and Blanchard contact lenses, and also our platinum sponsors, AccuLens, Alden Optical, Contamac, Essilor, Menicon, OptiView, Paragon Vision Sciences, Synergize, True Farm Optics, Visionary Optics, and Excel Specialty Contacts. This is also our silver and bronze sponsors, Boston Foundation for Sight, ABB Optical Group, Visionary, Easy Lens Applicators, Today's Vision, and Valley Contacts. So thank you so much to our sponsors. Please visit their website um, and, and support them for supporting us. Okay. Well, this is uh, Michael Lipson. I'm going to start off. And these are very, very basic uh, slides on scleral lenses. And I'm going to kind of go through these relatively quickly. Some of you are new to sclerals and some are very experienced, but essentially, we got to know what we're talking about, and when we talk about scleral lenses, the, the main definition of that is a lens that does not bear on the cornea. So it's totally bearing on the sclera with total clearance of the cornea. Um, we have defined from the Scleral Lens Society, a mini scleral lens is a lens that is up to six millimeters larger than the patient's HVID, and uh, a large scleral lens is one that is at six millimeters or larger than the HVID. And these lenses are all made of materials that are highly breathable as listed on the bottom of the slide. Again, this is a, a diagram of the uh, scleral lens resting on an irregular cornea. And there are three basic zones that we were always going to be discussing about scleral lenses during the fitting process, which is the optical zone or the base curve, which uh, really has the least influence over the overall fit. Uh, the transition zone, which uh, somewhere transitioning from the optic zone to the landing area or the haptic zone of the lens. Um, and the haptic zone and the landing area of the lens is a set of peripheral curves. And it's aimed to vault over the limbus, land softly and evenly on the conjunctiva overlying the sclera. So how do they actually work and benefit our patients? Well, by clearing the cornea, there's no bearing uh, in that optical zone. Uh, the limbal clearance also clears the limbus and transitions so that it gently goes over the limbal area, the sensitive limbal stem cells, doesn't irritate that, and uh, provides a, a tear reservoir between the lens and the eye at that point. 
and then it lands gently on the sclera, uh, conjunctiva overlying the sclera, and that's where the scleral shape becomes important. We're going to talk about that a lot more in a little bit, but really the ultimate fit of that lens depends on a couple of things that we change on the lens, but how much elevation there is to the cornea. We're going to talk a lot about elevation and height. Uh, when we refer to the cornea, we talk about elevation. When we talk about lenses, we talk about depth, you know, sagittal depth of the lens. And uh, when we talked earlier about uh, mini or larger scleral lenses, they all have the same basic philosophy of clearing the cornea. And uh, the goal is to find a lens that will vault over all the corneal irregularities while landing gently on the sclera. And it can be done with large or small lenses, and it depends on the individual patient or the individual condition on which one is working. But again, getting back to the concept that I just mentioned before of elevation and uh, on the cornea, we, we fit scleral lenses not so much based on the base curve, but the sagittal depth of that lens relative to the sagittal height of the cornea. Now, in this uh, demonstration of a Scheinflug image, basically these two corneas have exactly the same central K reading or central curvature of 44 diopters. But uh, the one on the left basically is on a cornea that has an 11 millimeter HVID and a much larger HVID on the other one. So if you look at the sagittal depth of, of those two situations, they're significantly different, almost 1,500 microns of difference. Um, I'm sorry. Um, so you can see how much uh, role the HVID has to, to do with this. The lenses that would fit properly on this cornea would be significantly different, even though the K readings might be the same. So K readings uh, we take, but they're not de the main determinant of the fit. So this is a really important concept to understand here. And again, how do we evaluate the uh, sagittal height of our individual patient's cornea? Well, certainly one way is to just kind of look at the eye from the side and you can have a direct observation and it's, you can get a good feel of it after you've done a number of these, but it's really not totally reliable. It can be deceptive based on a number of other factors. but. Um, and one of the main reason, main ways that we do this is through just empirical putting a lens on a cornea that we have a known lens and, and see what it does. And we'll go over some of those observations in a few moments. Um, next thing we can do is uh, do an OCT, which uh, again usually isn't able to see the whole cornea, but it, it can get a very accurate sagittal height measurement. We can do corneal topography, but Basically, that gives us height of the cornea, not necessarily all the way beyond at the square where the lens is landing. But there is specific software, say, by Medmont and others who will actually extrapolate that data. And uh, we can go into more detail about that later if we need to. But the other newer technology that's used to evaluate the height of the cornea and the overall height of where that lens is landing is based on scleral topography. And uh, topographers that go out to 22 millimeters will be able to get the overall sagittal depth and be able to say where there's toricity on the sclera, sclera where the lens is landing. And examples of those are these uh, three uh, SMAP 3D and the eye surface profiler, able to go out very far to get those measurements. And when we talk about the sclera and, and measuring its contour, we also have to keep in mind that where the uh, muscle insertions are. This diagram shows that uh, laterally is the, the longest area and nasally uh, the medial rectus is the closest to the limbus. So it does create some fitting issues if you get to very, very large lenses uh, out beyond 22, 23 millimeters. But um, Again, as you can see, if we take these measurements uh, of the basically down below the, the seven millimeters and the five millimeters on each side where the lateral uh, recti are, and the 12 millimeters of the cornea, you can see that you know out to 24 millimeters is where you're going to start running into those muscle insertions. And the other observation that's been made over a number of uh, studies um, is that there is a certain angle of the 
conjun uh, scleral curvature. And uh, out at 15 millimeters, we see that if you look in all the meridians, uh, starting at the top at 38 over here, down at 39, the differences on all of these meridians are not that great. But when you get out to 20 millimeters and, and beyond 15 millimeters, there gets to be quite a, a big difference, especially nasal, uh, nasal here and temporal over here. Um, quite a bit different height. In other words, the lens will actually land first on the, uh, if you're a large lens, uh, out at the nasal area and actually start burying there and tend to go a little bit temporally. And this is another uh, diagram of an OCT with these angles overlaid. And uh, you can see at 15 millimeters, we have an average angle here of about 39 degrees. And it's actually uh, a little deeper angle when you take it out further. And we're going to go into things about the limbal contour a little bit later in the uh, in the presentation here. And I guess the last thing I get to cover here for now, and then I'll turn it over to Longis, is the, uh, the junction at the sclera from the cornea to the sclera is not always what we think. It's not a big junction all the time. And most of the cases actually are, are looking like this diagram in number two, where it's a kind of a tangential, almost straight, not a really fine uh, geographic junction that we would normally think of. And about over 50% of them are actually like that. So again, that's something to keep in mind when we're landing that lens. So again, uh, when we talk about uh, uh, the lens selection, you know, and I guess I go on vacation now. When you're a scleral fitter, you look at things like this and think, is this a, a case for a corneal lens or a scleral lens? But anyways, uh, We'll talk uh, about Langis, and you'll take it from here on the risks and benefits. Yes, inside the, the question to ask ourselves is every time we have a patient in our chair, you know, should I, you know, fit him with, you know, the sliver lenses or other modalities? Because it's always a risk-benefit ratio compared to, to, uh, to, to other, you know, uh, options that you may have. So obviously sclerosis lenses are, are wonderful and they offer a lot of benefit. But in some cases, they they are not representing the uh, go-to option, uh, especially for the for summaries that they can you know um, display in in some under some circumstances. As for clinical applications, uh, in the past we we realized that several lenses were mainly used uh, to compensate for any kind of irregularity on the cornea to restore vision. Uh, out of those, you know, very bumpy uh, surfaces. And obviously because of the fluid layer that compensates these irregularities and the perfect optics of a gas perm lens on front of that cornea, um, we provided and in fact we restored the vision. So it was a, a very, very high benefit compared to any risk that, you know, uh, fluoro lenses may, may potentially uh, represent. Same thing for the disease eye. Because we create a microenvironment that is very unique and we really put a shield in front of the ocular surface and we don't expose that ocular surface to the regular blinking, the shear force, you know, uh, related to that, you know, that natural process uh, occurring in our days 15,000 times, 15, um, uh, 1,500 times per day. So at that, uh, for disease eye, it, it was natural to consider scleral lenses and, and to treat these eyes. And again, the benefit was very high compared to the risk. This is uh, another story for normal cornea because we see that industry and in the, in, in the practitioners moving uh, toward, you know, the fitting of normal corneas with scleral lenses, realizing that they had a lot of benefits and, and a lot of success with irregular corneas in this design. So why not, you know, using scleral lenses for normal cornea? And I, I'm totally with that, and I'm one of the, of the first to propose that and suggest that that that, that new pathway to to you know, utilize, you know, scleral lenses, but. Uh, again, uh, every time we ask to ask ourselves, you know, is it the right thing to do and is, is it the right option for, for our patient and it's still why, uh, you know, it's an emerging, you know, uh, situation that we have and we'll, we'll cover that a little bit more in, in the presentation. Next slide, please. So the clinical indications for the large, the larger scleral lenses uh, are certainly linked to the uh, traditional 
way to use lateral lenses to restore the ocular surface to, 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 to treat the disease eye. If you have a limbal cell deficiency, for example, or a very severe eye dryness like Steven Johnson syndrome, obviously you have to cover the, the most of the ocular surface uh, in, in order just to keep that ocular surface under the shield of the lateral lens and to restore it. So no question that you have to go larger at that time. Same thing for specific, you know, uh, type of corneas, pillus and marginal degeneration. As Michael said, we have to vault over the entire cornea and the limbus and to land nicely on the conjunctiva without doing any compression, considering the irregularity of the conjunctiva itself. But if you have an ectasia like pillus and marginal de de degeneration very low on the cornea, if you want to vault over over it with sufficient clearance, you cannot land very close to the limbus and to limit you know, the support of, of the lens on the conjunctiva. So you need a larger lens there. That's no question. Uh, smaller slower lenses are no option for these patients. On post-surgical patients, it's this very, very unique situation because you deal with not only irregularity, but you need, you, you deal with oblateness most of the time uh, of the cornea. So the cornea is no longer with normal profile, which we see on everyday basis on normal cornea patients, where the center of the cornea is deeper in the periphery is flatter. In those, uh, in those post-surgical corneas, it's the contrary. The center is flatter and, and the, um, the periphery is deeper. So you need to duplicate that in your design and, and certainly to use oblate uh, designs as, uh, for several lenses, and there are many options available in the market nowadays. But still, you know, again, it, it may need, you know, um, some specificities in your design. Keratoglobus megalocornea for sure. The larger the cornea is, the, the more coverage you have to do and the more vault you have to do over that large diameter, uh, then you need a larger lens as well. Uh, and but you have to, as Michael said, also you know, the, the further away from the limbus, the the more you are, uh, you know, away from the limbus, the more toricity you'll have on on the conjunctiva. And not only on toricity, but elevation. If you look at the elevation, recent data published by Greg Denier and Kristen Sen proved that, you know, the, the conjunctiva is just like, you know, a, a very irregular but at the same time symmetrical pattern, meaning it's more elevated superiorly, it, 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 it's less elevated inferiorly, but it's steeper as a curve inferiorly compared to the superior part of the conjunctiva. So it's very, very irregular in shape and, and just like waves in, in, in the ocean, you know, it varies from one quadrant to another quadrant. So if you are dealing with lenses larger than 16 millimeter, I would say in, in my experience, you, you be prepared to deal with you know, very high level of, of toricity um, and irregularity. That, need, that means that you need to design the periphery of your lens accordingly to that surface in order to align closely to the surface itself and to not, do not create any compression and or to the contrary any edge standoff in, in one quadrant in particular. This is why, you know, based on the Visser studies made in the Netherlands, they have a very huge and successful practice for many, many years in several lenses. They, they published that 90% of their lenses are made with toric peripheral curves. Not only it aligns, you know, better the surface, but it provides more comfort to the patient and you, you reduce the troubleshooting that you have uh, to do with, with, with several lenses over 16 millimeter again and over. Um, if you are dealing with smaller several lenses, then the conjunctiva is more spherical and more forgiving. And, and, and it's all depending not only on the diameter of the lens itself, but where the lens is landing and uh, ask the manufacturer about their appropriate design. Because some lenses, you know, labeled with a 17 millimeter diameter will land, in fact, at 15 millimeter of cord you know, on the conjunctiva. So this is exactly where you look, you have to look at, as for the touristy, the rest is just plastic supporting the lens. And other lenses with the same diameter will land, you know, a little bit further apart from, from the limbus. And so you have to deal more with that conjunctival touristy. So every design is different and you have to know your design in order to just to customize your fit and to troubleshoot any kind of uh, misalignment that you may have on the conjunctiva. Next slide, please. So, mini several lenses are, are, are 
more use compared to the larger ones. In my experience, my clinic is probably 80% of the patients that I can fit with mini sterile lenses, meaning 16 millimeter and under that. And most of the time I'm dealing with 15 millimeter and, and that's very, very sufficient to vault entirely over the cornea to land nicely on the conjunctiva. So the, um, the low and moderate keratoconus and the kind of dystrophies, the post-surgical, because, you know, we, we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit further on, not, not only because we need the nobly design, but, you know, these are fragile corneas and they need really to be to, to be fitted with caution and, and, and to provide enough oxygen to that, that kind of fragile tissue. And th this is only feasible if you limit the diameter of the lens and you limit the clearance and you limit the thickness of your lens over the exposed graft cornea especially. Re any refractive errors, including presbyopia, if you want to switch patients from soft lenses to several lenses for many reasons, uh, then you have to, to limit the diameter of your lens because, you know, the patient will not be able to handle and not, will not be interested, in fact, to, to handle his lens. And we have a very high rate of success with, you know, switching uh, patients complaining about discomfort, about, you know, float to envision and or residual astigmatism and or dryness at the end of the day. So there are 40% of your soft lens patients that are dropping out of that market just because they don't see well and, and they are not feeling well with their lenses on. So these patients interested in contact lenses can be better suited, better fitted with, you know, sterile lenses because that those lenses provide a unique environment, you know, and that will act against their dryness at the end of the day. And they pro provide also very, very stable vision. So uh, no matter what the size of the lens is, uh, if you use a larger or, or smaller lens, you have to do your, 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 your duty in order to fit them uh, with success. It begins with the case history. What is the ocular condition that you want to treat and, and you want to fit? Um, what are the other treatments uh, available? What are the other options to evaluate the risk-benefit ratio we just mentioned before? Um, what is the previous lens experience of the patient? What is the use of eye drops medication that can alter the, the, the lens fit at a given point? Obviously, these are gas permeable lenses, clear lenses. They do not absorb preservative agents. They do not absorb medication, but uh, let's say that you have a glaucoma patient and want to fit that patient because of his dryness in several lenses, you can uh, you cannot use the medication at the same time that the lenses are worn because you know you will alter the effect of the medication on glaucoma because of that and because the penetration in the tissue will be reduced by the presence of the lens. Uh, so you have to, to take that in account. Refraction is exactly the same thing. Uh, and, and certainly, we, we uh, more and more we use sterile lenses to deal with you know current refractive issues. But the irregular astigmatism is certainly well compensated with sterile lenses. Uh, as a second step, you have to take into account the corneal topography. And if you have a topography, you know the difference between the axial and the ten tangential maps. Axial is a kind of a you know general broad spectrum uh, view of of the shape of, of, of the cornea. And most importantly, it's not the cornea itself, it's a reflection of the tear film layer that you see through the, um, the topography map. So if you have a dry patient and in in, if you have an unstable tear film, your topography will mislead you. And in fact, you can see a keratoconus where there's no keratoconus at all because just dryness that accumulates over there and uh, alter the cornea. So in any doubt, to put an artificial tear drop on the, on the surface of the cornea, blink two, three times and repeat your topography mass in order to make sure that, that you have the right value at the right time. So HL, it's a broad spectrum overall view of the, the shape of the cornea. Tangential is a true power map, meaning that, you know, you see the, the exact differences and it's used mainly for pre and post treatment for autoke, for example. But in, in, in case of, you know, uh, sterile lenses, you can evaluate the difference between your baseline and your topography after a while. Uh, just to evaluate if there's a difference. And if there's a difference, should, shouldn't be uh, the case. So you have to act and to revisit your, your fitting. The elevation map is certainly more useful because it will tell you a lot about the hot spots on the cornea and where to look at. We, we think all the time that the apex of the cornea is the highest point, but that's not true in most cases. And the, steep, the steeper keratoconus, the apex of the cone is not always the steep the steeper uh, area of, the, of that cornea. It's all depending on where it's located. And if you have a keratoconus very down on the cornea and the apex is very low, 
So it's still the center of the cornea represent the highest elevation uh, point, and this is where you have to vault uh, really over that surface. Um, the, the shine fluke will give you a, a very nice view of the back surface, and, and it's it's a very good thing if you deal with with keratoconus because it will it will provide you a, an idea of what kind of irregularity you deal with. Corneal diameter is a key element because, you know, the, as I said, the larger the, the cornea is for the, these 15, 20 percent of abnormal corneas outside the average of 11.8 millimeter, you have to deal with smaller corneas sometimes, especially in Asian population. So you need an Asian design and or a smaller lens. And and uh, the, if you have a very large cornea, then you have to deal with larger several lenses. So you have to take that in account. Uh, several topography will mention that in the ang ang angle as well. Uh, next slide, please. These are the, the machines that we use to, to evaluate the conjunctival profile, the eaglet on the top left corner uh, coming from the Netherlands mapping, a very, very useful machine to map up to uh, 18, 20 millimeter and provide the angle also between the cornea and the conjunctiva and displays that uh, as a map, a color map just like you know topography so and you can derivate from that information the sagittal value the sagittal um, uh, elevation of that ocular surface so you can match that you know sagittal height of the ocular surface with the sagittal depth of the um, of the scleral lens plus the clearance that you expect to have under that scleral lens let's see that you have you know two 3,500 at a given cord at 16 millimeter uh, measured by that machine and you want to vault over by, by 200, 250 microns, then you select your lens according to that 3,750 or 3,800 microns. And this is um, the, uh, the topography map uh, the the elevation the difference between the actual map and the the eleva and the elevation maps and you see the keratoconus on the left hand side uh, where the apex seems to be very prominent but if you look at the elevation map where the cone is is probably the lower part of the cornea so it's not exactly where you want to look at to vault efficiently but it's on the upper cornea that you'll have to pay attention next slide please. Same thing for the um, the uh, keratoconus apex and the corneal apex not matching, obviously, and and certainly uh, we we have to pay attention to that. The entire goal and objective with our lenses is to all over the entire cornea, but elevation map will tell you where are the hotspots and 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 exactly where are the the weakest link of your fitting. Uh, and, and under the slit line, you will really have to to um, to uh, to assess that. And then what well, you, you you put the lens on the eye and you, you do your slit lamp uh, evaluation. No, not bef before, you know, putting the lens. You do your, your slit lamp evaluation. You have to treat any kind of ocular disease uh, uh, at, as, at the most you can before putting several lenses, especially if inflammation, chronic inflammation is in play because uh, inflammatory mediators will be trapped under that scleral lens and can just trigger the inflammation a little bit more compared to what it was before. So you have really to treat the disease as much as you can before you do anything else and then as as an adjunct therapy you can put the sterile lens in um, and and certainly you have to deal with you know the assembly ferrons and the pterygium and the blebs and 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 you have to adapt your 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 uh, fitting based on that and could be very difficult with some design other de designs are more forgiving they have a micro wall technology for example they can have a notch um, that goes around the pterygium uh, and or the high, the, the very high pinguicula, uh, or you can imprint the lens. There's technology available now. You can imprint the eye and mold a lens from that uh, imprint, and certainly it's uh, available and very valuable option. Uh, expensive, expensive one, but you know it's very valuable option when you have a bleb, for example, and you have uh, almost nothing else to 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 fit on those eyes. Next, uh, next slide. As for the application, uh, it's very important to to uh, educate the patient. Application removal are key element in my experience. Despite the perfect fit that I can achieve with with a singular patient, 
uh, most of my dropouts, and I don't have a lot, but most of my dropouts in several lenses um, are, are related to the fact that they cannot really handle their lenses either for application or removal. They have a hard time to do that. So uh, you have to, to educate the patient. You have to deal with that. And you have to respect the um, the, uh, the 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 physi physiology of the eye. If you have a very small aperture, don't try to put an 18 millimeter lens on that on that eye. So play with a 15 or you know a six, 16 millimeter lens, and you'll be more successful. As for the uh, the solution to put in the bowl, I don't think that we found uh, the perfect solution so far. Um, because the cornea need to be nourished, and what we have in play is obviously we have to 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 deal with non-preserved product. Any kind of chemicals in the bowl will remain there uh, for 10, 12, 14 hours, and will develop toxicity over time. Uh, buffer agents can can do exactly the same. Now we have two um, approved FDA-approved solutions that we can put in the bowl: the Life Repure from Anicon, and we have another one by Boston Lum. Uh, available um, off-label, we can use also inhalation solution. But because we have now FDA-approved, you know, um, products, I think that is a better uh, option to to prescribe to our patient, at least a safer one. And do not hesitate to put artificial tears. There's there are some with some electrolytes, and more viscous solution can help also to uh, improve the comfort, the uh, hyaluronate uh, sodium. Um, component in these artificial tears can help a lot. The more viscous, just like refresh elevis, for example, can help a lot as well. Uh, not only to improve the the, the 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 comfort of the patient, but to uh, alleviate deposits to migrate in the bowl. As for the removal of the lens, we use plungers, obviously, but it's important to break the seal and to break the suction of the lens at the end of the day. Uh, ask the patient to move the lens a bit uh, through the lids and or just by doing a kind of a push-up test and, and putting some pressure on the conjunctiva, make sure that the, 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 the suction of the lens is, uh, is broken before removing it. Otherwise, you can have difficulty. And when you, you put that plunger, don't put too much pressure on the lens because it will be, um, it will be, it will do the contrary of what we want to do. It will push the, the, the lens toward the, the in, in to dig in more in the conjunctiva, and certainly it, it won't help. But you know, again, you know, your staff can be very helpful in that, but you have to educate the patient. As for the lens solution, here are my algorithms for irregular corneas. Sorry for the busy slide, and uh, uh, if you if you want to have a copy of that, I can I can email it to you. Just let me know. But um, irregular cornea, you'll see that option one, the green boxes, uh, any kind of disease, any kind of post graft and post surgery and dystrophies. You know, sclerols are the option number one, except. If in post graft you have a cell count in the endothelium of less than a thousand cells per millimeter square, at that time because of the chronic hypoxic stress we put on the cornea with several lenses, no matter what the fit we do, um, uh, we 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 jeopardize the, the tissue and certainly small gas permeable lenses in those, under those circumstances are a better option uh, with or without piggyback. Piggyback helps for the, for the um, for the comfort, but any other kind of, of uh, situation for irregular corneas are better, you know, fitted with several lenses. Next one. As for the uh, regular cornea, obviously you have, you know, uh, Tom Jones coming at 18 years old. The baseball player wants to be fitted in contact lenses, minus two. You know, you you, you will fit him in silicone argyle lens, no question. No, uh, that, that's very obvious. But as 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 soon as this young uh, baseball player will complain about dust particles, discomfort with his soft lenses, dehydration during the day, end of the day, discomfort, fluctuant vision if this if he is a stigmatic patient with toric lenses that are not really providing the vision he wants, then you will jump to ministerial lenses with any kind of myopia over five diopters. Certainly, uh, ministerial lenses are, are, are my go-to lens, actually, uh, because they offer a larger um, optic zone, you know, 
high myopes have large pupil and soft silicone gel lenses, disposable lenses, have at the maximum an optic zone of 6 millimeter. If you put tericity in that lens, it reduces the optic zone up to 4.5 diopter, and, and certainly it limits, uh, you know, the vision that, that, that you can have clearly through the, these devices. And those patients with large pupil would complain about halos and glare, especially during evening time and dr or, or during driving under challenging conditions. So mini lenses will offer them 8 millimeter to 9 millimeter optic zone, and it's really uh, one way to address that issue. The other, the other thing that I want to emphasize here is for the presbyopic patients, because you know most of these patients are marginal dry eye patients, and they are so display you know some level of astigmatism, corneal astigmatism. Very difficult nowadays to have you know a soft disposable lens correcting presbyopia, myopia, and astigmatism with success at the same time. So sterile lenses for presbyopic patients are certainly the option number one to consider in many, in many, in many cases, especially if they, if they present astigmatism and kind, some, some kind of marginal dryness. Next one. Okay, I think uh, I'm going to take over a little bit for the next few slides. Now, basically, if we've screened the patient, um, we know where we're headed. We want to determine how we're going to proceed and how we're going to fit this patient. Now, for some of you who have fit uh, scleral lenses before, this is uh, something you've already wrestled with, but it certainly doesn't hurt to quickly review this. Um, when you select a lens, um, again, the first lens that you may select from your trial fitting set may be what we would like to call the middle of the set. It may be something that you select based on your intuition on how irregular the cornea is. If it's a really highly irregular keratoconus, advanced, you, know, you may need a lens just starting off and thinking about, I'm going to start with a higher sagittal depth lens. But after you put that lens on, certainly the first thing you want to look at is the overall diameter. Where is it landing? Secondly, you're going to evaluate second, central clearance uh, going further out from the center outward to limbal clearance and finally evaluating the profile of how it's landing. So first of all, in the, the lens diameter, the factors to consider first and foremost, as we said before, is your corneal diameter, the HVID, and you want the lens to land uh, outside the limbus and outside the cornea completely. Uh, you want to also look at the overall ocular health, meaning factors of severe dry eye, um, other uh, obstacles that may be out there as you get larger, uh, pinguecula or pterygia may be factors. Uh, factors to consider relative to the lens diameter also is how irregular the cornea. The more regular the cornea generally, the smaller a scleral lens is you can work with. And again, the more irregularity, the larger you have to be. As uh, Langis just mentioned, the endothelial cell layer status is a factor to consider relative to overall lens thickness and the, the clearance that you're targeting for those uh, compromised corneas. And then uh, I guess overall handling might be an issue to uh, consider. Uh, again, when you get out to an 18 millimeter lens, uh, it is a little more challenging to get in than a 16 millimeter lens. And so, again, all of these factors go into assessing the benefits to the patient and uh, any potential risks. But uh, this is a, a diagram of a uh, overall diameter assessment that you might make uh, right up after you apply the lens. And the, uh, the photo on the left, the lens is just barely clearing, it's not uh, quite having a large enough area to land on, and generally it'll cause discomfort due to its interaction with the limbus. And the picture on the right, again, is just the diffuse illumination with the uh, uh, blue filter here, and uh, again, the lens is centered, it's well beyond the limbus, and uh, again, you can see plenty of fluorescein under the lens. Um, the general rule of thumb is to think about at least one and a half millimeters on each side of the uh, the limbal area. So that would be three three millimeters larger than the overall corneal diameter. And uh, this is a picture without fluorescein. And uh, again, on the left, we see a pretty nice picture, nice white, clear eye. 
uh, and it extends beyond the limbus and it's going to be a very comfortable lens generally for the patient like that. Occasionally when we go a very large like the picture on the right, it'll create some different kind of compression forces. Uh, sometimes if it's a little landing a little too heavily out and right near the edge, it'll actually compress the sclera and it may show what we're seeing on the lower part of the picture, which is what we would call conjunctival prolapse, where the pressures exerted by that lens are forcing the conjunctiva to bunch up and uh, be drawn in over the limbal area onto the cornea. Uh, we can talk about that in a little more uh, depth a little later. But then after you've looked at and evaluated the diameter of the lens, we want to look at the overall sagittal depth. And again, it's really, really important to keep this concept in mind that, again, sagittal depth of the lens is determined primarily by the overall diameter of the lens. Uh, but changes in base curve can make a change, but not as significantly. Again, uh, the, the picture uh, down below is basically supposed to represent two different contact lenses, the black area, which would be the uh, sagittal depth of a lens that's 13 millimeters and one with the exact same base curve uh, on the right, uh, 14 and a half millimeters. And it, you can see it creates a much higher sagittal depth or sagittal vault of the lens. So even a one millimeter difference uh, in size can may have a significant difference in the overall sagittal depth. And then you're going to evaluate the central clearance of that lens, and there's a couple ways to do that. Certainly, the general diffuse lighting first, you want to look at, see if there's any bubbles under the lens. But if you were taking a, uh, a slit lamp view of this with the fluorescein in there, if you use white light, not a uh, filtered light, but white light under high magnification, you're going to look to see how the slit in this diagram shows a profile of all the different layers that you're going to be interested in here. Going from uh, left to right, the outer thin green stripe basically is the tear layer on the front of the lens. Uh, next you'd see the uh, actual thickness of the lens which appears black. In this case this lens is a known lens of uh, 0.35 millimeters thickness or 350 microns. And then behind that is the uh, tear film layer, which in this case is approximately estimated to be the same as the thickness of the lens. So you can say that's approximately 350 microns of clearance. And behind that, the uh, light uh, tinted would be the cornea itself. And if you think about an average cornea of about 530 or 540 microns, that's another way to evaluate this. But if you're dealing with keratoconus, you can't always rely on those average thicknesses. But this is the picture that you're looking for, and this is what we would call a one-to-one -one ratio of the tear layer thickness to the lens thickness. And uh, again, this is a, a different picture, not quite so highly magnified. But uh, this is a, a slit. You need a really good slit lamp with a high uh, intensity beam and uh, in your optic section to really get a good view of this. And this is one of the most important skills you'll be able to develop in evaluating the lens. And you want to be able to give this information very accurately to any consultants that are going to help you with the fitting. And what is the ideal uh, vaulting that we want to create? Well, that varies depending on the design of the lens depends on the uh, condition on the, that you are treating and uh, again a number of factors of the how large the lens is but uh, the literature basically reviews this and said you know if you have 50 to 100 microns that's considered a, a pretty low vault and uh, 100 to 250 is, uh, is moderate and above 250 is considered fairly high and again um, this will vary dependent on how long the lens has been on the eye. And we will talk about that a little more in a minute, but settling here. Um, normally, you know, when you first put the lens on, you want to look at it first. Just see that there's no bubbles under the lens, and those happen from uh, slightly losing too much solution on your application process. But you can get a pretty good picture, 20 to 30 minutes, 
after, and it will have settled. In other words, if you evaluate it immediately after putting it in, and then 30 minutes later, there will be less tear layer thickness under that lens. It will settle into the eye. There have been a number of studies done on this, and uh, again, there is some settling that is seen sometimes between four and eight hours, but approximately 50% uh, of it may take place within the first 30 minutes. So uh, again, this is just a little hint at the bottom. If you really had to wait a long, long time and you wanted to, you could put a soft lens over so the patient could see during that time. Um, and again, the initial clearance will vary with time. Um, overall uh, settling that you have to kind of account for during your initial evaluation is that the mini scleral lenses, because they're um, bearing on a smaller area, will settle a little bit more. Uh, approximately 100 microns in the larger lenses, uh, maybe over 16, 17, 18 in that range, um, maybe about 80 microns is average. But again, that varies tremendously on the individual patient and also the diameter of the lens that you're working with. And uh, I'm going to turn it back to Langis for this next part here in evaluating uh, limbo clearance. Yeah, when uh, you're done with uh, the central clearance and uh, you have to move toward the, uh, the the limbal area, as we said, the scleral lens is not a corneal scleral lens, meaning that we will not allow any touch in any part of the cornea at any time. Uh, and the settling issue have to be taken in account, as just Michael said. You know, if you begin with a higher vault and you expect a clearance, uh, lower clearance at the end of the day, make sure that you don't have and we will you will not have you know any touch over the central cornea nor in any part of the cornea and certainly not over the limbus it was said that you know uh, uh, touch over the limbus would would uh, affect the stem cells um, I, I do not agree with that and I talking with Eric Pappas recently uh, from Australia uh, stem cells are very very located deep in the in the, in the cornea and certainly in any kind of just bearing on the surface will not affect them. Um, as for oxygen delivery, the closer you are to the cornea, the better oxygen delivery you get. So it's quite impossible to affect, you know, by hypoxia, these stem cells or the limbus. But what you will create if you touch the limbal area is a mechanical stress over uh, these fragile uh, cells that are, you know, located at the limbus area and disrupting the, um, the, the arrangement of these cells. These are the younger ones who will migrate toward the center of the cornea after seven days and they will be uh, slide out, sliding off after that and replaced by new ones. But these are the young babies of the corneas over this that are very fragile. So, so, so certainly you don't want to hurt them mechanically. If you rub them too heavily by a contact or by, by, by a touch, you will disrupt them, you will create staining, and over time you will create also neovascularization. This is not exactly what we want to, to, to have as a perfect scenario. So this is why it's very, very important to vault over the limbus. But at the same time, we don't we don't want to over vault over the limbus because that space is crucial also as for accumulation in the, the, of debris in the reservoir and to create conjunctival prolapse, especially on the inferior uh, part of the conjunctiva. So if you have too much clearance over the limbus, let's say that you have over 45, 50 microns, then you open the door very nicely to any kind of debris. There's a suction effect under that, the those clear lenses because the lens is is, is uh, digging in the conjunctiva, compressing the fluid layer, so it creates a it's not a negative pressure because the cornea would collapse on, on the back of the lens, but it's kind of a suction effect, so the debris are, are, are just moving in. There's no tear exchange when the lens is stabilized. So if the, if the space over the limbus is too large, then the debris will just accumulate, and in a matter of a few minutes, you will, you, you'll get a fogging effect, and you have a decreased vision occurring out of that. Same thing for the prolapse. One of the ways to resolve that is to go with, you know, smaller 
clearance over the limbus certainly and and it's very very important and one of the way to assess that it's really not to use the the blue filter because as it is displayed in that slide here you you can you can be misleaded by by that that kind of image you see through the slit lamp if you see that those dark areas you may figure out that you know oh gosh i have no no fluorescent over there so i have a touch over the limbus in fact under 45 microns you know there's no fluorescence occurring and it's be, it's visible it's not visible through blue light but you may have still flu fluid and you may have some fluorescing over there so under white light is way better to to evaluate your fitting and and sliding your illumination from temporal to nasal to make sure that you know you cover all the areas and you don't have that shadowing effect because if you are from angle because of the the high vault over the cornea you'll get a shadowing effect and then you can be misleaded but you know it's very important again to 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 co to cover that and to assess that in any doubt let the patient go and have the patient back in a matter of one week or two weeks remove the lens stain the cornea if you have an any touch at any time that can disrupt that cornea you will see a, a staining in a circular in a ring pattern and it's certainly not appropriate and you have to modify the lens accordingly most of the manufacturers you know will offer you just to vault over that particular area and they put they will compensate the other uh, curvature and the other clearance to keep exactly the same uh, fitting for for the central clearance for and for the landing but um, yeah, consult the manufacturer because each design is different but you can m really modify just that area in order to get a little bit more if needed of clearance over that limbus. Same thing if you want to lower the clearance because you have a debris, too much debris in the reservoir or a prolapse, then you can modify just that and everything uh, will be compensated to keep you know, the overall appearance of your sterile lens fitting exactly the same. Um, as I said, in any doubt, you see on the right uh, superior corner here uh, a ring of, of, of compression that is really associated with a tight lens, and probably a too small lens. A small uh, on that cornea, you see that cornea is is larger. And what is tricky also, we know now that the cornea is oval shape; it's not round uh, shape. Uh, you know, the 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 horizontal meridian is, is longer. Uh, and the vertical meridian is shorter, and the limbus is more elevated in the vertical meridian compared to the to the horizontal one. So in in some cases, it can make you know the fitting trickier and and more difficult. So you have to adapt your 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 uh, floor length fit according to what you see at the follow up. Very important to follow your patient one week, two weeks, and to stain the cornea without the lens. So if you have a limbal clearance, as I said, uh, you can just modify the curve. In, in, in some circumstances, you may want to, uh, just like, if you have a staining, just like uh, on the left, you see some central staining, and you have a very, very high compression, and you see indentation very near the limbus. So that lens is, uh, is probably too small. So you have to move a little bit away from the limbus, so go, go larger. And you know, most manufacturers will offer the option of varying their diameter and or just vault over over the, the, the limbal area, and, and it will be easy to troubleshoot that issue. As for scleral bearing, uh, again, it's very important to, to do not compress and to the country to do not uh, have an NH standoff over the uh, the uh, the conjunctiva. One of the main advantage of scleral lenses over a small gas frame lens is habitually because they're more comfortable because you have no lens to lid interaction. You land nicely on the conjunctiva, it, it's digging in the conjunctiva after a few minutes and then there's no lens to a lid interaction occurring just like with the edges of a small gas berm. But if you're you have a standing off in one quadrant, then you'll get uh, you'll have this, you know, lens to lid interaction back and the discomfort will just be increased. The photo on the left will uh, will uh, is showing you a compression. We we call that a blanching of the conjunctiva. So that means that the lens is compressing too much on the tiny and small blood vessels to the to the point to impinging the the, the regular blood flow in in those small vessels. So in, as a consequence, the conjunctiva becomes white. And when you'll remove that lens, you'll get a flushing effect. You know, you'll get a vasodilation where the vessels were compressed just to restore the normal blood flow and there will be a, a red ring uh, 
um, occurring just after lens removal. And some patients will complain of that. Uh, that 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 tells you that the lens is too tight at that time. Again, you are, you can you know modify many things to alleviate that. Look at every quadrant, especially if you are dealing with larger lenses, meaning that over 15.5. A 16 millimeter you have to deal with toric peripheries most of the time the horizontal meridian is too steep to compress and you have a perfect alignment in the vertical one so nowadays many manufacturers offer toric peripheries and consult them to know how much microns you have to to remove in order to get the perfect alignment uh, no longer is acceptable that you have a, a compression in one quadrant and a perfect alignment in other ones so because of the technology evolves and uh, nowadays we really want to have a perfect alignment in every quadrant uh, 360 degree around the cornea. So no compression and certainly no blanching. Uh, and look at the very tiny vessel, not the big ones. And even on the right side, you have, you know, a, a small compression. The big vessels are not impinged and the, vas the blood flow is, is, is not altered. But if you look at the smaller one, yes, you see that, you know, you lose some, some, some redness and, and uh, you have some blanching occurring as a consequence. So it's not, it's not really acceptable. Uh, this is uh, showing no compression. You have a very wide conjunctiva. The smaller vessels uh, are not altered. They do not change direction. And you can really flow, uh, follow the blood flow uh, from the exterior of the lens to the uh, under the lens and after that uh, to, the, to the cornea. So it's, it's very really what we want in every quadrant. Um, and the uh, top left slide show you a high edge lift. Uh, and, and that patient will certainly complain about lens awareness and lens discomfort. Uh, if you modify just that periphery, you can have, you know, quadrant-specific design. Nowadays, you can have the manufacturer to do that and or to do toric peripheries. In that, in that case, we would say, you know, give me, you know, in, in, in horizontal meridian, you know, a steeper, you know, um, a steeper curve and a flatter one in the vertical one. Uh, it, it's not really necessary to evaluate the right axis because uh, the lens that is made with toricity will align itself with the conjunctival toricity. So it's just the amount of, of, of differences between the two principal meridians that you have to give to the, to, the, to the lab. And it could be very difficult at the beginning to evaluate that. I would say that in average 100 microns, 150 microns of differences is, is necessary to um, provide a, a, a toric effect and to release that compression in, in some quadrants. And uh, when you are well aligned, you still have to check for resistance, meaning that you do a kind of a push-up test. Yeah. Lenses or lenses will not move upon blinking. That's expected because they are in the conjunctiva. They are deep in the conjunctiva. Um, but you don't you don't have to have resistance. You don't have to uh, have difficulty to to lift that lens with the lid if you do your push-up test. You know if that occurring, that means yeah, that your peripheries and your, your overall fitting is too tight because the, both are, are uh, corresponding. If you have too much clearance centrally, let's say that over 300 microns of clearance, then the lens is vaulting too much and is landing too heavily in the conjunctiva, so it will compress the tissue too much and it will dig in uh, deeper in the conjunctiva compared to another lens that is fitted with lower clearance over the central cornea and certainly will land more nicely over the conjunctiva. So as for the other refractions, final step, you, you do your over refraction, spherocylindrical. Um, we, we don't know exactly why, but in some cases we will find residual astigmatism. Most of the time it's because the lens is decentered and that that's happening really with larger lenses over 16 millimeter. It, with, you know, 15 millimeter lens is very, very rare that you have a lens disintegration because you deal with spherical conjunctiva and the lens is more centered. Um, but because the, the shape of the conjunctiva, which is, you know, higher and flatter in the nasal superior quadrant and lower and steeper in the temporal inferior quadrant, then naturally the lens tends to slide 
toward the temporal, you know, quadrant and inferiorly by gravity. And that creates, you know, a kind of a prismatic effect in the tear fluid layer under that lens. And that can, you know, obviously affect the overall refraction. The other thing that we, we estimate that is, you know, uh, occurring at that time when the lens is decentered is the uh, increase of eye order aberrations. And the best way to that we have, you know, it's not the perfect way because we have not wave, wave front capacity to uh, to adapt to several lenses. But uh, if you if you uh, measure a refractive astigmatism in, uh, in over refraction induced astigmatism or residual astigmatism, most of the time it's really linked to the presence of high order aberrations, not not true presence of astigmatism, but you know, correcting with toric lenses, uh, toric in the sphoropter, you know, in front of those scleral lenses will help to reduce slightly uh, these high order aberrations and we are uh, looking at coma essentially uh, that are that are present and um, that, that that is the number one case. The irregular uh, tear fluid profile as I mentioned is the second one and, and flexure certainly uh, can play a role but I don't think that's the case in most uh, patients. Uh, unfortunately, manufacturers are producing lenses very thick, 350 microns and more, uh, so it's quite impossible to flex that material uh, if you are well aligned in every quadrant. If you're not well aligned in every quadrant, that's a problem, and then you can distort that lens, and then, yes, you can have residual astigmatism, but it's not a problem of the lens thickness. It's, a, it's, a, it's a really a problem of several lens, several uh, alignment and lens alignment on the conjunctiva. So if you manage to align every quadrant appropriately with toric peripheries, if you deal with over 16 millimeter lenses and with appropriate landing with smaller lenses, uh, not necessary to have toric peripheries at that time, but you know, not compressing the tissue, then you will alleviate most of the flexure, which is uh, better for the ocular health on the long term. As for the best lens care system, we recommend non-preserved uh, care system like per hydrogen peroxide. Personally, I had a few issues with the hydro light recently, putting a film on the surface of the lenses, attracting deposits. So I'm back to the regular clear care and or the, the Boston Simplest solution. Um, off-label, very off-label, I use also the BioTrue uh, cold chemical system for some patients because of the sodium hyaluronate inside of that solution that conditioned the lens surface and it's very, very, very effic uh, highly efficacy uh, to, to disinfect with, with this dual mechanism. Um, as to fill in the lens, we already mentioned that we have to use a uh, non-preserved product. It's very, very essential as it is for the drops that we put in, in those eyes during the day. Next slide. Follow-up is crucial, as we mentioned. Certainly, you have to follow your patient to address any issue they may have. Uh, if you fit presbyopic patients, let the neuro adaptation to occur as you do with normal soft multifocal lenses. A week, 10 days, and habitually it resolves many of the problems that you may have at, at, at delivery. Um, but certainly, it, it's, it, the scleral lens patients should be closely followed up, uh, or certainly for the first year and then after that, a regular follow-up. What to look for? Uh, comfort, uh, especially. This is my first question I ask every time. How do you feel with your lenses? And I don't expect uh, nothing uh, than, you know, oh, I, I feel great. I don't feel them at all. Uh, because if they have, you know, lens awareness, at the beginning it could be acceptable, but after, you know, at 10 days, two weeks, three weeks, certainly not, you know, acceptable, and you have to revisit your fit. Most of the time is because your your edges are too flat, and you have some lens standing off, edge standing off in, in, in one quadrant. Uh, ideally, the number of hours should be equivalent to any kind of other lenses, 12, 14 hours a day, the wearing time, and should be comfortable. These lenses should be comfortable all day long and provide very good vision. So um, review your and educate your patient about uh, uh, handling is very, very important every time. Uh, recheck for the you know, the, uh, the uh, compliance with the um, care regimen and the non-preserved product they may use, and certainly then you'll have a very good success. 
So in summary, sterile lenses are wonderful technology. They, they are really representing a breakthrough uh, since the last four or five years to restore vision and to treat ocular diseases. And nowadays, it's, it's moving toward the normal cornea arena to deal with the 40% of patients that are you know, complaining about discomfort and, and, and dryness at the end of the day. And certainly, we have plenty of options. And in your practice, you should have you know, a larger lens for the, those cases we need, you know, to be addressed with larger diameter lenses. Let's say that you have a larger cornea, you want to treat disease, and you want to treat very severe heart dryness. But you have also to have, you know, smaller spheral lenses for normal corneas and smaller diameter corneas with auricular refractive errors, presbyopic patients, astigmatic patients, and low to moderate keratic corneas. So you have to play with, as you do with tari, soft auric lenses and soft multifocal lenses, you have to play with, you know, several designs and to know their designs and consult the manufacturers because they are the most expert guys for their own products. Certainly, they, they are a very valuable uh, resource for your practice. All right. Well, thank you so much to Dr. Lipson and to Dr. Michaud for a very thorough presentation. And we are having another webinar on Wednesday, August 23rd at 8.30. That'll be part two of the Fitting and Troubleshooting um, series. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take some time to ask a couple of questions. I know we're a little over the hour, but we, we do want to get everybody's questions asked. So this question I'm going to address to Dr. Lipson. Um, what is the lowest endothelial cell count to be considered for scleral lens use? Well, the magic number seems to be around 800 uh, cells per square millimeter. Um, again, some people have, have put that number a little bit higher, but you have to really be careful because, again, any compromise to the amount of oxygen getting to that cornea, uh, it may decompensate in ways that you don't like. So. All right. So the second question I'm going to actually direct towards Dr. Michaud. Um, this question says that many scleral lens designs are going with toric peripheries, even in the mini scleral designs. If the scleral within 16 millimeters is pretty spherical, why aren't we seeing that change of more toric designs? Uh, and so that's a good question, but it, it's it's related to um, the conjunctival anatomy, and uh, both eyes are not mirror of each other. Some 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 eyes are are highly toric from the limbus toward the per, toward the conjunctiva, and and some some conjunctiva are almost spherical. So we we don't really know on every patient, and we never are able to assume that. But in general, generally speaking, at 15 millimeter of cord. Uh, the cornea, the, the conjunctiva is more or less spherical. Over 15 millimeter, then you begin to deal with a high level of toricity, and at 17, 18 millimeter of cord is even higher. So oh. in, on one point. On the second point, it's where the lens is landing. If you have a lens of 16 millimeter landing at 15, then you land on the spherical conjunctiva, and then toric peripheries are not necessarily needed. But if you have the same 16 millimeter lens landing at, you know, let's say 15.5 or 17 millimeter lens landing at 16, then yes, you need toric peripheries because, you know, the conjunctiva there is expected to be highly toric. But, you know, also, it, it's the slit, uh, slit lamp evaluation that will tell you if you have a compression over in the standoff and if there's a compression, then you know in one credit that, you know, that conjunctiva is toric. I was just going to say that uh, some of the scleral topographers are giving us some very interesting findings now that uh, certainly the scleral uh, toricity does not seem to match what we see on the cornea. If you have a with the rule cornea, you don't necessarily see uh, what we would call with the rule scleral toricity. And the uh, meridians that are flatter or steeper may not necessarily even be 90 degrees apart. They may be very irregular. And, may have differences in different quadrants. So uh, we're learning a lot about scleral topography now. So. All right. Well, that's a, a good answer to a, to a great question. And I think also there's just, there's different eyes. There's people that fall within those norms and people that are a little different. So there's different ways we want to kind of treat those patients. So um, Michael, I, I have a question for you here. This is kind of like a case presentation. So if there's a patient that's fit in a mini scleral lens, uh, perhaps a patient with dry eye or post-LASIK, with good clearance, about 150 microns of central clearance, but after an hour, they're getting a lot of debris. Can you outline some of the possible causes and suggest a few changes? Well, there's, uh, it's one of our more frustrating type problems when the fit looks good, 
patient is clear, uh, the eyes look clear, but the vision is not, and the tear layer gets this debris. As uh, Manjis mentioned it in his presentation, it has to do with sometimes these uh, fluid forces underneath the lens. In other words, if there are areas in the lens that have more clearance, say, you know, you're estimating 150 central, what is it, you know, mid-peripheral? What is it at the limbus? And uh, my feelings on this is that we really want to ideally try to get a more the most uniform tear layer possible across the whole cornea to uh, minimize these suctional forces that seem to draw fluid into the lens and not let it out. So again, the first uh, answer to that would be uh, trying to reduce limbal clearance, uh, maybe trying to um, make the peripheral curves slightly flatter and uh, Again, each one is going to be kind of individual. All right. Thank you very much. Um, I have another question here for Dr. Michaud. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the importance of maximizing oxygen transmission, especially the requirements for the cornea and the limbus? That's a very good question, and it would take a, a few minutes, and we will address that specific, specifically in the next webinar, so stay tuned on that. But very briefly, how to maximize oxygen is to keep the lens thickness at lower than 250 microns, the initial central clearance under 200 microns uh, after stabilization, I would say, and and uh, because at the end of the day, then you'll 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 have 100, 125 microns centrally, and uh, the lens thickness itself will will not be uh, be be enough to provide you know. Uh, restriction on oxygen delivery, but over 250 microns of clearance, the models and uh, practical models, uh, theoretical models, and in vivo studies showed that you know you penalize you know oxygen and you create a, a hypoxic stress of around one to two percent. It doesn't seem to be a lot, one two three one two percent of edema, very comparable to physiological edema, but it's a chronic edema that you know stays there for the entire wearing time. And a very, very recent article showed that, you know, if you put a keratoconus cornea under severe hypoxia, in fact, you increase the, the chances of thinning of that of that surface. So that uh, chronic hypoxia, chronic stress, we don't know a lot about the, the, the outcome, the future outcome of that, but we have to be very prudent on that, certainly on, on fragile corneas. But if you look even at normal corneas, you know, it's, it's, this is where the risk-benefit ratio is very important to address because with the unknown long-term effect of the chronic hypoxia, then you have really, really to pay attention. There are ways to fit lenses on these normal corneas to alleviate that stress to occur. So meaning that you limit the central clearance and you limit the, the lens thickness as well. But we'll address that in the next webinar. Okay, I know we're running a little short on time, so I'm just going to ask one more question here to Dr. Lipson. You know, uh, we do know that you do a lot of ortho-K. There was a question that came up. Um, have you ever tried scleral lenses for myopia control? Um, that's a good, really good question there. I, I personally have uh, only used probably a handful or two or three cases of actually a scleral lens for ortho-K, but not specifically a myopia control. But Scleral lenses, we do have plenty of options, and if we talk about myopia control and you talk about distance center multifocals like we do with soft lenses, that certainly can be done with scleral lenses the same way and uh, to create that optical uh, effect of uh, myopic uh, defocus, peripheral myopic peripheral defocus. And um, again, the lens centers really well, so that's an advantage with scleral lenses to be able to put those optics really well centered. But uh, again, that would be especially applicable to patients who have uh, astigmatism because it's going to correct the astigmatism um, and do the uh, myopia control effects with the center distance multifocal. All right. Well, very interesting. Well, I want to thank everybody who tuned in today um, to join us from the Scleral Lens Education Society for this webinar. And thank you to Dr. Lipson and to Dr. Michaud for sharing all of their knowledge. Uh, we'll go ahead and um, we're going to stop the webinar here. It will be recorded so that you can view it again if you have any other questions.